Man, again, great to have you guys in service with us this morning. We've been doing a series that we're calling uh, This Is Us. It's based off of the television a series called This Is Us. I've noticed that they've started running a series or season one again um, on NBC, and you can pull those, uh, pull those times up and watch that. It's a really good series. I don't promote series, television series too much, but I think this series um, has a lot of really good things in it. I obviously don't um, agree with everything that's in it because of our secular society. They put their things in there. But I think that we can look at it and be able to glean from um, some of the lessons that we see taught and some of the issues that come up in the process. And so I, I want you guys to, if you can, to, to be able to watch that. In this clip that we're going to watch this morning, it takes a little bit of a, a backstory and a little bit of a, even a forward-going story. This family that is depicted here in this, in this clip now are grown. Um, they're all grown. They're, one of the guys, uh, one of the sons is married and has a family. They're actually doing Thanksgiving at his house. And through the process, the young man that you'll see here in, in the video was adopted at birth. His biological father, uh, once he was born, I believe the mother died. She was a drug addict. And the father took the little baby and put him on the steps of a fire uh, station and then took off because he knew that he couldn't re raise him. He was in, uh, addicted to drugs also. And so this little boy was raised in a, in a family with other brothers and sisters, was loved, nurtured, given every opportunity to exceed, and the little guy did. I mean, he really exceeded above his other family members. He became a very successful uh, businessman and had a beautiful family of his own. And now he's in the process of being adopted and being a minority, he's in the process of all of his life, he's felt like the outcast of his family. The rest of the family was white, he's black. He always kind of had that outcast feeling in his family, although he excelled and became a very successful person. But he always had that outcast. And this is the point in, the, in this series where he found out, he learned who his biological father was, and then he found out in this clip, he found out that his mother that raised him had known the biological father. And now all of that frustration of 36 years of all of the stuff is now coming out where he's saying, you knew, you know, you, you knew of my father and you kept him from me. And it's the process that he goes through of this pain of his past and how he deals with it. And so I want you to get this. If you've seen the series, it'll flow right with you. If you have it, you'll get a little bit. I want you to catch this just the power of this drama, and then we're going to talk about the pain of our past as we watch this, uh, as this morning as we talk. Watch this, watch this clip. Man, isn't it amazing how the dreams and plans that we had as a child just didn't seem to come out the way that we planned them. Even our best efforts, it just didn't work. As you see, the very last part of this clip, it reverted back to when they were when, when Randall was young, and you'd have to see the, the episode to understand they had a Thanksgiving that kind of went awry, and they ended up uh, being in a, a hotel together, just the family. But it really set the stage for the rest of their Thanksgivings. And that end scene showed the mom and Randall there with everybody in bed together. They were sleeping there, and they went to sleep with great memories. But as time goes by, just stuff happens. Things happen. Incidents happen. Things are said that, that cut. Problems arise within family units or within divorce situations and, and home situations or work situations or school situations. You can fill in the blank, but our life ends up being filled with painful situations and there's no way that we can avoid it. There's no way that we can avoid it. We're either going into or coming out of some kind of painful situation that we have to figure out how to deal with in our life. And the problem is, is that most of us are either coming in or going out of that with no encouragement or no help from other people, especially us guys. We can handle it. We can do it. We're strong enough. We're smart enough. I'm a man. I can fix it. The problem is, is that we can't. We can't. 
We have to have some help to be able to process this. Pains that we go through in our life are so huge in our lives that we get blinders on and we can't see anything past the pain in my life. But what I don't understand is everybody else sees that pain in my life and knows how it affects me and the direction of my life, but they sometimes are afraid to step in and offer a hand of help or offer love to help me through that situation. And so this morning, I I just felt like that I wanted to talk about how you deal with pain in your life. How do you deal with the painful situations that come up in your life? And I really think there's two ways that we deal with the painful situations that come up in our life. Number one is we learn from them. We learn lessons from these painful situations. We look around and say, listen, I understand what went on here. This hurt. This was painful. Let me try to consider what came into this process and what the other people in this situation are going through. And let me find ways to make this different and make this better. Sometimes we can't change things. I can't change things that other people decide to do. I wish I could. God doesn't even change some of the decisions that you choose to make. I wish he did. But you see, we are not puppets. We're free moral agents, and we go that direction, and God helps us through the process of that. Years ago, um, when I was a youth pastor at a a local church in Broken Arrow, there was a young girl in our youth group that was having some drug and alcohol issues, and we sought to get her help, and eventually she uh, ended up in a um, recovery hospital here, Brookhaven, um, here in Tulsa. And uh, I was part of the process of coming in and doing some counseling with her and her family. As, as a youth pastor, I came in and spent time. I was close to the family. I'd known them for a long time. And when I was in one of the sessions, um, the doctor there, and I apologize, it was f- so long ago, <clears throat> I, I didn't keep names or I can't cite this specifically, but he made a statement that I'll never forget, a scenario a story that he told. He said, here's the thing, human beings are the only creature that God created that can reason themselves back into danger. He said, let me give you an example. If there's a cat that's on a fence and he wants to get to the other side of the yard and there are dogs in that yard, if that cat makes the choice to jump down into that yard and try to make a run for it, most of the time those dogs are going to catch him and he's going to get chewed up. If the cat survives that chewing or that beating and that cat makes it back out of that back out of that yard, that cat will never again jump into that yard, ever. Ever. He learned his lesson, he'll never do it. Human beings are the only species that God created that will set up there on that fence a month later and say, you know what? I think I can do it this time. I think I think I can make it. I'm gonna go for it. Because that dog over there, that one wasn't very mean. That one over there has got the bite. That one hurt. But that one wasn't that bad. So if I can get that one over there, and this, I bet you if I go right through here, I can make a, I can make a break for it. I'll wait till they're not looking. See, us humans, we process that. We think that we can get through that process. The thing is, is that we'll jump down in there, get chewed up again. Two months later, we're back on the fence looking. I think I can do it this time. I've learned. I've learned from these last two times. I've learned. I think I can do it. And we keep going through this process. The problem is, is that we never learn the lesson. We keep going back into the same situations we're in. Hey, you know what? You do the same thing with relationships that you go through. This guy, man, he is so cute. The other one was an idiot, but this guy, he's going to be different. He's cute. He's so nice. He's got such a nice car. He's so cool. No, no, no. He's the same way as the other one because you're the one that's picking him. This situation is different. You don't understand. These friends, I'm just having fun right now. They're just the cool people to hang out with and they're popular and everybody likes them. And those are the kids, if I could just be with them, I would really feel good about myself. No, you won't because they're going a different direction. Let me, I say it all the time. You show me your friends, I'll show you your future. You end up marrying someone that you spend time with. You don't go through high school and college doing what you want to and living like you want to on the edge of life and then all of a sudden one day decide, listen, I'm going to throw all that away and I'm going to start finding the right person. You've missed the right person for all these years. You need to find the right people to hang around. You need to learn from the pain of your past. Learn from the situations that you're going through and don't get into those situations. And the second thing is, is that 
you can either learn from it or you can blame it. You can either learn from it or you can blame it. Well, it was all my dad's fault. It was all my mom's fault. It was all my ex's fault. If she hadn't have done that, if he hadn't have done that, it's all my kids' fault. If my kids would have made the right choices, I wouldn't be in the situation I'm in. It's all that coworker's fault. He's the one that ratted on me. He's the one that told that I stole that money. If he hadn't have told, I would have been free. Everything would have been great. But you see, we blame everything and everybody else. And if we're not careful, we will spend the rest of our lives blaming the monsters on the outside of us and never dealing with the monster on the inside of us. Does that make sense? We can either learn from it or we can blame it. And let me just kind of go through a few scenarios here in the Bible to just show you this scenario as it plays out through history and through biblical history. <clears throat> there was a story I want to share with you just a second uh, before I jump into that. <clears throat> a story of a, of a girl who was on her way home from work. And as she was coming home from work, it was kind of late in the afternoon, but she was driving and her car began to sputter and she ran out of gas on the side of the road. She sat there for a while, didn't know this was before cell phones or any of that kind of stuff. She didn't know what to do. A gentleman stopped and offered to, to help her and she said, thanks, can you just give me a ride to my house and my husband can bring the, and he said, sure. She got in the truck with him and he didn't take her home. He took her out into the country uh, several miles away from the road and he um, pulled over and he brutally raped her and, and left her there in the woods for dead. He drove away, left her. She didn't know where she was. She was bloodied and beaten and bruised and barely conscious. And she was able to get back on that road and walk several miles back to the main road that she recognized and there she just collapsed on the side of the road and waited, tried for someone to come and help. She didn't have any strength to even wave. She was just there on the side of the road. Finally, someone did stop to help. But it was the guy who had done it in the first place. It was the man who had beat her and raped her and he put her in his truck and took her back even farther into the country and did the same thing over again. Well, the good news is that she did survive. But the bad news is, is that now she has the memory and the pain of what other people have done to her that she will carry around with her for a long time. I know that's like a worst case scenario. I understand that with you guys. And, and I'm throwing that out there for, for effect to get us to stop and think about that. Listen to this. There is always someone who is worse off than what we are. There is always someone who's gone through worse and made it. But there's also people who continually blame the situations that are around them, and rightly so, I understand that. But we have to learn from Scripture and from history how to process that. And I, I want you to just, I want to just to show you some situations in Scripture here. Exodus, the first chapter, begins a great story in Israel's history. In the Christian tradition and the Christian belief system, we go back and look at Israel because Israel was the nation that God chose to bless. And the Old Testament is basically written on the process that Israel went through, their love affair and their directings and their growing and their problems and their issues. And, and here is this process, and it chronicles the men and women who contributed to the Old Testament that told this story. We pick up this story here in Exodus, and Joseph was uh, the young man with the multicolored house coat. Remember that? His dad made him a coat of many colors, and he mouthed off to his brothers. His brothers sold him in slavery, and he ended up being a, a official in, in the Egypt uh, kingdom, in the Egyptian uh, army and in, 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 the, in the government there. He ended up being a high-ranking official that... The, the Pharaoh and those in charge uh, trusted him completely. And at the end of the story, we see 
him, he is now dividing out the grain and the surplus for the people, and he has found his family and his brothers, and the king has had great favor with them and says, bring, bring all of them over to Egypt. We're going to give you a piece of land for you to live in. We want your whole family to come. So they came, and now several hundred years have passed, and the Israeli people, the tribe of Israel and the brothers and all the family have, have grown and expanded. God has blessed their families. And now they are growing and expanding and they are doing well and they are strong and they are amazed at the way these men are growing. Well, we come into the first chapter of Exodus and the, the former king dies, there's a new king and he begins to look at all these Israeli tribe and he decides, you know what, this is going to be problems, we're going to have to get a hold of this because th these people are growing too fast and getting too big for us. So we need to do something to stop that and control it. We need to do something to, to change this situation. And so that's where we pick up our story. And I'm going to read a little bit of this in Exodus, the first chapter and 11th verse. It says this. So they put slave masters over them and oppressed them with forced labor. And they built Python and Ramesses as store cities for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed and the more they multiplied and spread... So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites and work them ruthlessly. They made their lives bitter and hard labor in brick and mortar and with all kinds of work in the fields. In all of their hard labor, the Egyptians used them ruthlessly. Look at verse 15. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, and I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce their names. I never can do that. And we always have to bleep it out of the video. So I'm just going to keep going, all right? Verse number 16. Anyway, that's the midwives. When they helped the Hebrew women in childbirth and observed them on the delivery stool, if it is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, let her live. So here's, here's this king, and he says, listen, we are gonna, we're going to put these people in slavery. We're going to control them. We're going to dominate them. We're going to work them ruthlessly. They're going to be our slaves. And we have to control this population. So if there are any women or if there are any babies that are born here, we want to kill the boys and we want to let the girls live because they're trying to control the population. Now, Israel went through this process for several years. They, they were dominated. They were the slaves. They were... They, they, they built these cities, they built these kingdoms, and they were the ones that were the labor force to do it. You see, it started out as a good situation. Joseph and all the favor of his family, now it began to turn. It wasn't any of their fault. They didn't do anything wrong. It was the, the decisions of one man who caused this tragedy upon this, this tribe. And now it's it's story that we look at. Israel went through this process of time and they were brutally treated for many, many years. I don't know, maybe you have felt like that. Maybe you've looked back and said, God, why didn't you prevent this? God, why didn't you change the situation? Because here I am in a situation where I'm going through pain, I'm going through turmoil in my life and it just seems like there's no, there's no way out. Well, God wants us to know that he knows what's going on. But again, God doesn't choose to change history with decisions that are made. Ruthless people still make bad decisions. And we sometimes are the ramifications of that. We're the ones that are hurt from that. But people can make decisions that hurt us. And these decisions and these hurts have to be dealt with us in some form or fashion. As we go on through this scripture, I want you to just turn with me uh, to Exodus chapter 14. I'm just going to read some portions of scripture here real quickly just so you can get an idea of, of the process of what happened. Israel was finally delivered. Moses was brought onto the scene. He was born. He got through the, the midwives. He was born, uh, but because they were trying to kill the babies, they put him in a basket and he was floating and Pharaoh's daughter found him and was raised in the palace as one of the, the officials uh, as a son of Pharaoh. And then as the process went, now Moses becomes the one who's going to deliver the people from Israel, I mean, Israeli people from Egypt. So you know the story. They had the plagues, the burning bush. Finally, Moses and Aaron, his brother, went in and they said, we want the people, and they took him. So Pharaoh let the people go. 
And now all of the people of Israel are going out into the desert. They're, they're going out into the promised land. And Pharaoh and his army are quickly behind them. They're going to get them out in the desert and kill them. So here we have this situation. Pharaoh and his army are behind them. And now they're coming up. And they come to the Red Sea. What are they going to do? They got the Red Sea in front of them. And then they got this army in back of them. And what do people do? They start griping and complaining. I know it didn't happen in your family. It didn't happen in this church. We've never had it happen here before. But I know some places they have issues where people begin to gripe and complain. Let me just show you what happened. I mean, they're not even a day's a day or two away from, from this situation. And here's what happened. Look at verse number 11 of chapter 14. They said to Moses, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us into the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Did we say to you in Egypt, didn't, or didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone, let us serve the Egyptians. It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. Can you believe it? I mean, they have just barely been out of this situation, and now they're already complaining and griping about the thing. Look at chapter number 16, verse 3. Chapter 16, verse 3. The Israelites said to them, uh, said to them, if only we had died at the, Lord, at the Lord's hand in Egypt, there we sat around pots of mead and ate the food we wanted. But you have brought us out into the desert to, star, uh, to starve this entire assembly to death. They're still griping. Verse number 17. Chapter 17, verse 3. Chapter 17, verse 3. But the people were thirsty for water there, and they grumbled against Moses. They said, why did you bring us up out of Egypt and make us and our children and livestock die of thirst? I mean, can you believe this kind of stuff? They just keep going. More agony, more problems, more disgruntlement. If you jump all the way up to chapter number 32 of Exodus, it all comes to a head here in chapter number 32. Moses is up on Mount Sinai getting the, getting the tablets, getting the, the Ten Commandments. He's hearing from God. God is explaining everything that he wants Moses to know about how to rule these people, how to direct these people, where they're supposed to go, what they're supposed to do. He's given them the whole lowdown. And here are these people, while Moses is gone, all of a sudden they say, listen, he's gone. He's gone. He's been gone several days. He's never coming back. We got to do something. What are we going to do? They went to Aaron, Moses' brother. What are we going to do? Aaron said, tell me what. Tell you what. Bring all your gold and silver. We're going we're gonna to make a, a calf, and we're going to make a golden calf, and we're going to worship it. You know what they're doing? They're saying, listen, this, this isn't working for us out here. This Christianity, this God thing isn't going to work for us. So we're going to go back and serve the, the gods of Egypt. We're going to go and serve the gods of our ancestors. That didn't work for them either, but at least they had food and they had a kingdom and they had houses. We're at, they start to look at anything else they can and they built a golden image and they begin to worship it and enjoy revelry and all kinds of crazy stuff. And you know the story. Moses came down out of the mountain and discovered what had happened. God told him up there what had happened. And he came down, and he was the first one to break all Ten Commandments. Do you know that? It says it right there in the Bible. He threw the Ten Commandments down and broke them. And then he got Aaron, and he said, what in the world is going on? Here's what Aaron said. He said, listen, these people, they are stiff-necked and stubborn. They wanted to serve a God, another God, other than our God, Jehovah. So I told them, bring all your gold and silver. And I took all their gold and silver, and I threw it in the fire, and poop, out popped this golden image of a calf. Come on, really, Aaron? It says that. You can look here in chapter 32. It explains the whole thing. Yeah, he said, just poof, it just popped out. So they just started worshiping it. You see, people have this tendency to always blame other things and look to other things to try to place blame on other people or other situations. And we see that right here in Scripture. That's what was happening. Israel began to blame other people. Israel began to blame Moses. It's Moses' fault. It's Aaron's fault. Moses, is all your fault because you brought us all out here in, in this desert. And here we are. Moses, you brought us all the way out of Egypt. You delivered us from Pharaoh. You delivered us from our bondage. But now that we're out here, I think it'd be better if we were back in that situation. Folks, we have that human tendency to always want to look back at the situation we're in. We're that cat that's on the fence, and we start looking in that yard and saying, I think I can make it this time. If I could just get back in there, I think I can do it. We, we can't, and we live our whole lives blaming other people and letting the pain of our past dominate the future of where we're going. 
But let me tell you how God wants us to do it. God wants us to learn from our past. Now, switch with me, if you will, to Deuteronomy, the fourth chapter. Deuteronomy, the fourth chapter. Just keep turning a little bit farther over in the Old Testament to the book of Deuteronomy. And I've got a few scriptures I want to throw up to you here. Deuteronomy was written by Moses. Moses understood that now we're getting ready to cross into the new promised land that God has promised for his people. And God asked Moses to put these words down. And Deuteronomy is nothing but a, a, the story of the whole process to let those people know because there was a whole new generation 40 years in the desert, there's a whole new generation that's being raised up and the old generation is gonna die and this whole new generation is the one that's gonna go into the promised land. And in this process, God wanted all these people to know of the great works. And so if, if there's a couple of words that really epitomize the book of Deuteronomy, it's the word remember and the words don't forget. Remember and don't forget. And actually, forget is used about nine times in the whole book, and remember is used about 19 times in this whole book, which is unprecedented from any other book. Now, you go to Psalms, and there's you know, lots of chapters in there, and there's more of those words in there. But for just the, the books, or for just the chapters in this one book, it's unprecedented how many times God says, remember or don't forget. Let me just show you a couple of those things. Verse number four, or chapter number four, verse number nine. Only be careful and watch yourselves closely so that you do not forget the things your eyes have seen or let them slip from your heart as long as you live. Again, Moses is talking to the people. Verse number 23, look down just a little bit. He keeps going. Be careful not to forget the covenant of the Lord your God that he made with you. And... and it goes on. I won't continue to read that. Look, look at verse number 31. For the Lord your God is a merciful God. He will not abandon or destroy you or forget the commands with your forefathers, which he confirmed to them by an oath. So again, now even God is saying that he's not going to forget these situations and the things that go on. Keep going. Chapter number five, verse number 15. Chapter five, verse 15. Hang on. Here it is. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt and the Lord your God brought you out of here, of there with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. Uh-oh, there's the Sabbath. We'll have to get into that another time. Chapter number six, look at verse number 20. Chapter six, verse number 20. Just keep turning one page over and right there it is. Chapter six, verse 20. In the future, when your sons ask you, what is the meaning of the stipulations, decrees, and laws of the Lord our God has commanded you? Tell him, we were slaves of Pharaoh in Egypt, but the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Before our, before our eyes, the Lord set miraculous signs and wonders, great and terrible, upon Egypt and Pharaoh and the whole household but he brought us out from there to bring us in and give us the land that he promised on an oath to our forefathers. I love that because he says, with the mighty hand of God, when your children ask you, why are we doing this? What is this process all about? Dad, tell me about your childhood. Mom, tell me about what it was like when you were a kid. Instead of you going back and saying, I had the meanest mother in the whole world. My dad was a drunk. He was mean. He used to beat me. He used to do all kinds of stuff. I would go to bed crying and hurt. I, was, I spent my whole life doing this and this and this and this. And you go through the whole process of continually blaming someone else. You know what God says to do? Don't go back and blame anyone. If you'll notice through these scriptures, he never went back and said they were beaten and they were brutalized and it was wrong and they should have, something should have happened. He never went back and did that. But he said, listen, look at your past and learn from that and understand, I want you to see that even in your misery, it was by the mighty hand of God. 
Tell your kids not all the, the stuff about your past. Don't go into all the detail about what happened to you, but let them know, I came up in a tough situation. I had a mom or a dad that was tough. I married the wrong person. I did the wrong thing, but it was the mighty hand of God that came through and rescued me. It was the grace of God that we see even in the Old Testament that came and rescued me out of that situation. Because folks, let me tell you, blaming everybody else is never going to change your situation. It's not even going to make you feel better. They say it's like drinking poison and expect the other person to die. Unforgiveness that we harbor in our heart does nothing but destroy us mentally, physically, and emotionally. But what God wants us to do is say, listen, remember what happened to you, but here's the thing I want you to remember. I pulled you out of that situation. I brought you along. I helped you through that process. You're no longer in that home. You're no longer in that situation. Someone came and helped you out. You finally hit rock bottom and you decided to make a change. It's the process that we go through that we're going to learn from, not blaming other people about the situations that we're going through in our lives. Does that make sense to you guys? We have to learn to process this situation. Listen to this. As long as we stay focused on the pain of your past, you will never see the destiny of your future. As long as you stay focused on the pain of your past, you'll never see the destiny of your future. If all of Israel would have always talked about the pain that they went through in their past, they would never understand that there is a destiny in their future that learns from their past. And I promise you, at some point in your life, there's gonna be other things that happen to you. And if you can learn how to deal with the pain of your past, you'll know better how to go through the pain of your future. That's tweetable. That's tweetable. Thank you. Thank you. So what shall I do from here? So what shall we do going forward? I give you three things. I don't know. I said it last week. I don't know why God speaks to me in threes, but maybe, I don't know, maybe it's the Trinity. I'm just not sure, but maybe I stop at three and you guys are all saying thank you for that. Um, number one is this, ask God to take away the pain of your past. Oh, that seems like a simple thing. Mm, sometimes. But the thing I want you to hear is I want you to ask God to do it. We can't deal with the things of our past on our own. And I believe that there's some people that say, well, I, I made it through the thing in my past by going to a doctor and going through all this process and going through counseling and all that. I understand that that happens, but somebody gave that doctor wisdom. Amen? God, even when we're not doing what we should, God still has, uh, uh, helps us with our life. He's still working things out for us. So, so here we are. Ask God to help you with the pain of your past. Ask God, say, Lord Jesus, would you help me with the situations that I'm going through in my life? Because the pain of my past is so great that I cannot deal with it alone. I need someone to help me through that process. When I was a kid, I know you guys, well, I, the older I get, you're going to believe this, but when I was a kid, I was always heavy. I was always a big kid. I was always the fat kid. Um, I never knew I was skinny until I hit puberty and I grew up real tall. I think when I was 14, think about this, when I was 14, I was 6'4", and weighed about 130 pounds. I had a 29-inch waist, but I still felt like I was fat because I'd been fat all my life. I just, I, that's just the way I was. I was just the big kid. But because of that, it created such a stigma in me. It created a insecurity in me when I always felt like I was the, the, the biggest kid in the groom. I would never take my shirt off. I would never go swimming with other kids because I'd have to take my shirt off. And I'm just being honest with you guys. And, and I was like, I've been like that all my life. And the older I get, I'm getting fatter as time goes by. But when I was younger, it was, it was such a problem um, that it was just that thing I lived with and I never could get rid of that. I never could get rid of that process of what other people thought about me because it was important to me. But what I came to realize, and it was probably in my, I don't know, sophomore year of college as I was trying to apply for a leadership position that they said, you're gonna have to go through this psycho psychological test. And I took this test and after the test, they said, you need to come in and talk to one of our counselors. <laughs> Why, what? And I loved it. I had a really good time. I enjoyed talking to him, but I went in and talked to this counselor. And that's one of the things that we, we dealt with is 
that thing in me, the thing in my past that always felt like I had to please the people who were around me. I always felt like that. And I'll never forget the counselor said, when how you feel about yourself is tied to the fickle emotions of other people, you will always be dependent upon what other people think about you instead of who you are. And he says, you've got to be secure with who you are and know that God made you the specific way you are. If you don't like who you are, change it. Okay? If you don't like your weight, change it. Some of you say, I've tried. Okay, keep trying. If I don't like certain things about my personality, change it. If you don't like the people you're hanging around with, change it. Unless it's your spouse, then fix it, right? (laughs) Or your kids, then I don't know. Wait and they'll grow up and break your heart. I promise they always do. (laughs) Fix the situation. But listen, my emotions can't be tied to the fickle needs and the fickle emotions of other people. I have to know who I am. And that's this process. I'm not going to take that long on all these things, but let me keep going. God may not take away the memory of your past, but he will take away the pain of your past. Then the memory that's associated with it will eventually go. Give me just a few minutes. I got got to elaborate on this. And and I've got a story with it, if you guys don't mind me, me doing that. Again, back it goes back several years ago. I was talking to a young man. A cowboy, we had a cowboy come into our service one time. He wore his hat, he was a cowboy. And I got to know him and talk with him and one Sunday after church, I sit down with him back on one of the back rows of the church and I said, tell me what your story is. And he began to go through and tell me about stuff that he had done when he was younger, mistakes that he had made. He'd served time in jail. He'd beat people up, he'd hurt people. He was a bad kid, bad kid. He caused a lot of problems. And he says, and I can't get that out of my mind. I went to jail, I paid the price for it. I can't get that out of my mind, it's still there. And he says, and and I, I have anger because my family allowed me to do it. I have anger because my friends encouraged me to do that kind of stuff. And I just have anger in my life about some situations that happen. And I said something to him that I just said. I've never said it before, but it was like the Lord put it in my heart to say to him, listen, I said, if the memory of your past may not fade, it may not go away, because we can remember those things, but listen, if you'll ask God to take away the pain that's associated with that memory, the memory will eventually leave because the memory of that is associated with that pain. I remember it because it was a painful thing that happened in my life. If you'll ask God, God will take away the pain so that the memory will eventually go with it. And I've thought about that since. It's been something that's always been in my heart. Think about that, folks. That's the way pain works. Pain becomes a painful thing in your life, and if you can move the pain aside, if God can take that pain away, the memory of what will happen and what did happen will go with that pain. So ask God to take away the pain. Number two, focus on the process rather than the pain. Focus on the process rather than pain. Make a choice to dwell on how you made it through the problem instead of what the problem was. Focus on how you make it through. Focus on the process. What happened? I went to God. God's helping me with this. I'm developing this new process. I'm getting through this pain. I'm not going to go back and be mad and angry about what someone said to me 10 years ago because they said something that hurt me and now I'm holding that over them and that kind of feels good because now I'm in control but the problem is is that you're not affecting anybody else you're only affecting you because these are the people who have moved on with their lives you're the one that's harboring that pain you're the one that's harboring that resentment the thing you have to do is get rid of that situation get rid of the pain get rid of it and focus on the process of where you're coming from instead of the pain that you had in your life. And that's the thing that you should do. And here's the third thing and the last thing. Ask God to take Egypt out of you. Ask God to take Egypt out of you. Lord, you took me out of Egypt. Now take Egypt out of me. You took me out of that bad relationship. Now take that bad relationship out of me. Lord, you took me out of my sin. Now take my sin out of me. You took me out of my pain. Now take my pain out of me. 
We sometimes can get so excited because we've left the situation, but if we always have that allure and that desire to keep going back to that situation, we'll never allow God to take Egypt out of us. He's brought us so far. He's helped us with so many things, but the healing process is when God can finally take Egypt out of us instead of us continually to go back to the Egypt that we live in. Another story. When I was in college, I had a guy that I admired. He was one of my heroes. I looked up to him. He was a football player. He was a musician. He had recorded some albums. I used to play the keyboards for him, and he would sing, and we would go travel around and do things. It was a lot of fun, but I just admired him. He was a strong man of God. He knew where he was going. He was always quick to pray. He was always quick to encourage I've been with him at times where we would be out places and he was the one that was always reaching and loving and ministering to people. I just loved his whole heart. I kind of lost track of him after college. I knew he got married and went into some missions work and I would see him every once in a while and that was about it. A couple of years ago, I was watching television and it was a Christian talk show that I had passed by that was out of Branson and he was on there. I thought, hey, I know that guy. And he was telling his testimony about how he lost his marriage, how he lost his memory, how he lost his ministry, how he lost it all because of alcoholism. You, you're kidding me. I had no idea. And he made this statement. I'll never forget it. He said all the way through college and high school, he said anytime I would go through pain or suffering or hard times, he says I would always go back to alcohol because alcohol was always my friend. Wow. That, that hit me hard. I didn't know that about them. But I thought, that's the way we are. We look for something that is familiar. We look for those idols of our past that we always go back to because it's instant gratification. I can go back there. I can take a couple of drinks and I can relax. I can, I can smoke a couple of joints and I'm back. I feel relaxed. It's a, it's a place where I remember. It's a place where I can throw away all the stuff in my life. I can get rid of all my stuff. I can, I can get out of the pain of my situation. I can, you know, I can, I can go onto the internet and I can pull up some images and it's instant gratification. I'm all of a sudden brought into a certain place that feels good and I enjoy that. But can I tell you, those things are fleeting. Those things never satisfy because you always have to have more and more and more and they always destroy you. They destroy your family. They destroy everything around. That's the way that process goes. But can I tell you that if we can ask God not only to take us out of Egypt, but to get Egypt out of us, get sin out of us, let me find my rest not in pornography, not in alcohol, not in stimulants, not in flirting with other people to try to get that gust back that I had when I was younger, but when I can find my rest in him and understand that he can be the one that suffices me, he can be the one that lifts me up, he can be the one that encourages me, and when I wake up in the morning, I feel better than when I went to bed instead of worse. I don't have any past memories, but I can be in his presence, and he can take away all the situations of my life. That's what the Christian life offers to you with pain. Lord, you took me out of Egypt. Now take Egypt out of me. Let me get rid of the sin and the stuff that goes through my life. And here's why. Because Jesus paid the price so that you could be free from your chains. Jesus paid the price so that you could be delivered. He hung on a cross and paid the penalty of sin so that we as believers could be completely free and know what his presence was. I've got two more scriptures I want to show you here at the very end. They're just really quick, and I just want to throw them out here at you. Matthew, the sixth chapter, right at the end of the Lord's Prayer, here's the words that it says. It says, for if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you also. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive you your sins pretty strong words about the need for us to forgive other people. And then again, in the fifth chapter, in the 23rd verse, it says this, therefore, if you are offering a gift on the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift in front of the altar first, or leave in front of the altar, first go and reconcile it with your brother and then come and offer your offering. God is saying this, 
Forgiveness is such a huge part of who God is and what he does that he offers forgiveness to everyone. And he says to us, I offer forgiveness to you and I require that you offer forgiveness to everyone who's around you. In fact, it is such a big part of his worship or of our worship to him and our being in his presence that he says, listen, before you even come and worship, before you even come into my presence, if you have something against someone else, and you're holding something against them, if you have unforgiveness against someone, go to them, leave your offering, leave, leave your business here at the altar, leave your offering here, and I want you to go to that person and ask for forgiveness, ask to reconcile that relationship before you come back and give this offering. Malachi says, why bring worthless offerings to the altar? I would that you'd take your name down off the front of the church that you would come and bring offerings to me that are pure. That's what God wants from us. He says forgiveness is such a big thing that before I extend forgiveness to you, I expect you to forgive other people. I, ex I expect you to, to offer that forgiveness to other people. And that's what the Lord wants us to do this morning. He wants us to be healed. He wants us to get out of Egypt and to get Egypt out of us. I want you to bow your heads with me if you would, please. Lord Jesus, this morning, I stand in the front of a congregation of people who are not exempt from pain, but Lord, they have experienced pain in their lives. Some of them, Lord Jesus, it has altered their course of life and they still can't get past things that have happened to them in their past. And Lord Jesus, the only hope that we have is to come to a loving Christ who also experienced pain, who also experienced rejection, who also experienced persecution, even to the extent of death on a cross for things that he did not even do, unjust things. But yet while he was on that cross, his last giving words were, Father, Forgive them because I'm learning from this process. I'm not going to blame people. I'm not going to curse them. I'm going to ask for forgiveness because Jesus, learning from the process, understood that forgiveness is all he could offer, and he offered that as his last dying words. Lord, if it was that important to him, to us, then, Lord, it's important for us to the world to offer forgiveness to those people who have been ruthless and who have hurt us, but by the mighty hand of God, we are here today because of by your grace, somehow we made it out of that situation. Somehow, Lord Jesus, you gave us the courage to get out. Somehow, you, let, you, you saved us, you spared us, and we're here today so that we can fight the process and you can help remedy that situation in our lives. So Father, I ask right now for your grace, I ask for your forgiveness and all of our hearts as we offer forgiveness to others. But Lord Jesus, mostly I ask for your healing hand to come and put your arms around these people this morning, minister to the needs that they have, offer healing to each one of them. In Christ's name we pray it. Amen. Stay seated for just a second. We're gonna pray. For, I wanna pray for you guys. I'm gonna ask some of you actually to come up and we're gonna offer prayer for you. I, I wanna tell you that the, the rest of that story, I didn't get to complete it. I saved it to this point about the girl who was raped by the guy and then brought back and raped again. The true story actually, and the story actually goes that they found her, in the, she went to the hospital and she was there. And after a few days in the hospital, obviously she was so traumatized that it was hard to get into her, talk to her. She was almost in a comatose state for several days. Finally, the hospital chaplain had made her way in and sat next to the girl and talked to her a little bit and just said, can, can we talk about what, what happened? And she said, sure. She said, I just want to let you know that at some point, I think it's best that you forgive this man of, of what he's done to you. And the girl very coldly looked over at the lady and says, there's no need to say that because I've already forgiven him. The, 
the chaplain said, I don't, I don't think you understand. I don't, it's not that easy. It's going to be a process for you. But I want you to begin to talk about that process of being able to forgive this man. And she says, I want you to know I've already forgiven him. She says, how in the world could you forgive him after all that he did for you, all that he did to you? And the lady looked at her in the eye and she said, listen, this man has already taken three days of my life and I refuse to give him anymore. I refuse to give him anymore. How tired are you of the pain of your past? How many years have you held resentment against somebody that you are completely justified in resenting them. They shouldn't have done it. They should have, whatever. It, it was wrong. You were wronged. I'm agreeing with you. I'm saying, I'm not saying that you weren't wrong. I'm not trying to diminish the fact of what happened to you. But all I'm saying is this. You can't control them. You can't control what has happened to you in the past. There's a lot of things I can't control that's going to happen in the future. But one thing I can control is the way I process what has happened in my past. And I refuse to give that person or those people any more time in my life. I refuse. I refuse. And I've had to do a lot of things in my life, I tell you. I know this gets into <clears throat> I know this gets into my insecurities. I realize that. And some of you guys know me way, way too well. But some of the most hurtful things in my life are when I have people in our congregation that I pastor and I love. I pray for. I I spot you in the audience and I make a beeline after service to get to you, to love you, to introduce you to other people and to help you and to counsel with you and to talk with you and pray with you. And it's always the ones that you spend the most time with are the ones that after a period of time, they decide that they're done and they leave. It's over. We're done. We're moving on. And Lisa and I are left holding the Kleenex box. And it may be my insecurities. And I, I'm okay to say that. But I want you to know, it hurts. On our 20th anniversary, we had a family at church ask us to go out to eat with them. And we went out to eat in the middle of the dinner. They told us that they were leaving and they'd been our close friends for years. We couldn't finish the meal. We got up and left. And went to our car and cried. And then came back on Sunday morning with smiles on our faces and loved all the people that were still here. Why am I saying that? I'm saying that because of this. I refuse to allow the enemy to hold that over our heads. So you know what I do? Those people who, do, I get back in touch with them. I let them know. We love you guys sorry things didn't work out I, I as quickly as I can I mend those fences why? because I don't want to be walking through Walmart and have to dodge my way around people that have used to be at our church or that used to have a relationship with us or someone who's hurt me or someone who said something that offended me I don't have time for that I'm going to offer forgiveness. I'm going to offer the love of Christ to the people who are in my life. No matter how much it hurts, no matter how justified I am, no matter how wronged I've been, and some of you have been more wronged, but you just have to come to a point where you say, I refuse, I refuse to walk around with this burden in my heart or this thing over my head. I refuse to let it happen. I did the best I could with raising my kids. I did the best I could loving the people who are around me. Did I make mistakes? Absolutely. Everybody does. But I made mistakes. But I come to a point in my life where I say, God, 
I refuse. I refuse to go the rest of my life carrying around a woulda, shoulda, coulda. I'm dropping it. I'm laying at the altar. Lord, you took me out of Egypt. Now I'm asking you, take Egypt out of me. Take, take the desire of sin away. Take the pain of the past away. I want to stand before God completely whole and completely free. Don't you want that, you guys? Don't you want that? I'm sorry, you guys, if, if you're if this is your first time or if you guys are new, I usually don't get up here and, and squall and bawl and do all this kind of stuff. But I want you guys to hear my heart. I don't want to be a guy up here that's perfect because I'm not. God knows I'm not. But I want to be someone who's there, who's going through the same things you guys are. And this morning... I'm including myself in this altar time because I need the prayers as much as you guys do. So here's what I'm asking. If you're here this morning, you say, Pastor, I got some pain in my past that's haunting me and I need to get rid of it. I've got some forgiveness that I need to get forgiven. I got some things that have happened that I keep going back to in my mind and replaying the tape over and over and over and trying to figure out how I could have done it differently. Push that aside. Can I tell you... Satan is the only one that's concerned with your past. He is the only one. He's the one that keeps bringing it up. God is only concerned with your future. Satan doesn't want you to think about your future because he knows what's in it for him. God wants you to understand that your past is done and the only difference you can make is from here going forward. So let's change the course of our hearts from here going forward and let God direct us instead of Satan remind us. Amen. If you're here this morning and you just say, Pastor, I need your prayer. Would you pray for me? I need healing from things that are in my past, pain that's in my past, things that have gone on, unforgiveness, stuff that I just keep going back, I can't get over. I need prayer for that. I need to be taken out of Egypt this morning. If that's you, and I expect it to be quite a few of you, if that's you, I want you just to stand and come stand up front here with me, and we are going to all pray together, okay? Come on, if that's you, stand from where you're at and come.